La professoressa Simona Berretta ci ha detto di abbreviare il suo curriculum e quindi la ringraziamo anche per la modestia perché sarebbe stato molto ampio il suo curriculum. Lei è professore ordinario di politica economica internazionale presso la Facoltà di Scienze Politiche e Sociali della Università Cattolica del Sacro Cuore. Laureata nel 78 presso la Facoltà di Economia e Commercio della Università Cattolica della stessa Università. Direttore del Master in International Cooperation and Development, naturalmente, poi membro del Consiglio Direttivo del Centro di Ateneo per la Dottrina Sociale della Chiesa, visiting professor verso, presso varie, varie università, naturalmente che vanno dagli Stati Uniti all'Ungheria all e naturalmente in Italia ed altre nazioni. Tra le pubblicazioni più recenti ha una lunga, vasta bibliografia, possiamo rammentare insieme a Mario Maggioni, Time, Relations and Behaviors, Measurings, The Transformative Power of Love-Based Community Life. Naturalmente un altro lavoro è il Towards the Global Common Good e finalmente l'ultimo del 2014, oltre che gli altri del 2016, si rifaranno naturalmente alle crisi finanziarie e come sradicare la povertà. La ringraziamo veramente per aver accettato il nostro invito e diamo a lei la parola. Prego professoressa. Sorry, thank you for invitation. I've been uh, asked to give my presentation in English, uh, which I will do. I apologize in advance for my speaking a language which is not my la native language. Um, this is the topic of my uh, presentation, and I have a very small PowerPoint that maybe can help following what I'm saying, and maybe can help making my presentation shorter, hopefully. Um, I will revisit the international community endeavor to promote development on the basis of development ideals. As Cardinal Tarkson mentioned, the international community also showed um, uh, okay, uh, coming and going attention to the development issues. Speaking of ideals, The post-1945 period witnessed a tremendous effort to imagine and realize a better world. Amid huge contradiction, a Cold War, decolonization, but development became a central theme for the United Nations action. In 1960, uh, when 17 new, new independent countries joined the UN, The international community sentiments were quite optimistic about the possibility of reducing poverty and promoting development. At the time, the most urgent development concern was reducing hunger. However, however uh, most uh, experts of the time realized that reducing hunger had to do with material growth. So the first decade of development was launched an action of gross growth plus change. The idea was that growth had to be ac accompanied by social transformation and poverty reduction. Uh, the idea was national economic planning, growth to be achieved by expanding investment in productive capital, and this productive capital had to be mostly financed by financial transfers from abroad, both private and public. The UN target was 1% of rich nations' GDP to be transferred to developing countries that were called at the time underdeveloped economies. Um, these high ideals were actually followed by practical actions. Um, but despite the fact that a uh, very interesting 1951 UN report titled 
measures for the economic development of underdeveloped nations, spoke of a, of a very broad idea of what development was about, industrialization became synonymous to development. Industrialization was seen as key to modernization and to poverty reduction. The first development decade provided important results. An average growth of 5.6% in uh, Africa and Latin America, almost Chinese rates. However, at the end of the first development decade, 1970, the international community realized that the standards of living of the poor were far from being satisfactory. The ILO in 1970 provided this groundbreaking report in which the main statement was policies for minimum living standards and for distribution of income should be given as much importance as policies for economic growth. So the basic needs approach was launched, but the 70s and the 80s came, and the 70s and the 80s were very different from the 60s. We all know about the oil shocks, we all know about the debt crisis, the oil shocks in the 70s, the international debt crisis in the 80s. These two decades left a very power, um, sorry, a very poor, um, performance in terms of growth and development and at the same time left great ideas, you may say ideals of the international community that had no follow-up. The basic needs approach that I already mentioned and also the new international economic order declaration that reflected the changing balance of powers within the international community. In a sense, the idea of putting people at the center of development was always present in the international community, never abandoned it. However, its practical importance, as I mentioned, was waxed and waned in the years. But the session, poverty, and inequality that were experienced in the 80s made, made it possible to launch in 1990 the human development perspective as the name, the new name of the international community ideal of development. Beyond economic growth, the human development perspective. This is something that changed the game in the international community leading to the Millennium Development Goals, the Sustainable Development Goals, which are about economic growth, but also about a lot of items that have directly to do with basic human needs, human flourishing, stated as the international community has been able to. We will come back to that. The UNDP had a great success in uh, collecting the good feelings, the ideals of the international community. The yearly UNDP reports made, it, made available to the international community a wide availability of data about local situations, about access to health, education within local communities. And this was a huge improvement. Moreover, the Human Development Report made the attention, focused the attention of the international community on monographic themes one year after the other. And all this helped a lot to move and to promote a discourse about development being something that goes beyond growth, beyond GDP. Even advanced countries have been embracing ideas that well-being is something that is not just measurable with GDP, although we must also tell that everyday practice in our rapidation period uh, tend to put much emphasis on GDP numbers again and again. You read a lot about GDP in newspapers, not a lot about human flourishing and human development. 
this broad consensus made it possible that the Brundtland report became part of the common sense of what development was about, promoting economic growth, but also social de development and also ecological um, attitudes. They were framed around this notion of sustainability, which is interesting. Sustainability has something to do with time and has something to do with balancing different attitudes, economic, social, environmental. But it looks like a hopeless world, a world, because sustainable may also mean how much I'm, I'm ready to give up of one dimension in order to achieve the other. A very potential, uh, potential a very serious potential risk of technocracy. I would like to step back and try, oops, no, go ahead, and go back to trying to understand what we can learn from these developmental ideals in the international community. First of all, I would like to highlight this idea of convergence versus divergence in the economic thinking and in the policy practice of uh, implementing those development ideas. First of all, the idea that growth was necessary was based on a broad consensus on a convergence model of growth. The idea, the economic modeling that was developed at that time in the 60s, in the 50s and 60s, is still with us. Most development studies, those who study development economics, still know that the first chapter is based on the solo model of growth. And the solo model of growth is the fresh, uh, the refreshed notion of the convergence parad paradigm by which poorer people per capita income will tend to grow at a faster rate than richer economies, eventually leading to convergence. Contemporary studies and even contemporary criticisms, criticisms take this paradigm as the starting point. This paradigm of um, convergence led to a short circuit in a sense, that you can, you can distinguish efficiency issues, production, growth, from redistribution policies. And uh, this short circuit separated planning about production, industrialization, and planning about social and human development. The idea was the trickle-down effect will work for some. For those that are exclu excluded, we will need specialized redistributional policies. This dichotomy between production and distribution in economic theory holds only within extremely simplifying theoretical assumption. The model stands if you allow no time, no uncertainty, no personalized interaction, no monopoly power, no power relations. That is to say, the convergence paradigm applies to a world which is not the real world. As a matter of fact, we had a very different view about development built in the very roots of the international community reflections on development. Contribution by Nobel Prizes like Gunnar Myrdal and others, Nurske, and uh, other economic theorists and policy advisors had a very different view of development since the 50s and the 60s. They were uh, highly reputed, but they never made it through the political discourse, the political process. This divergence paradigm is based on the idea that the economic structure 
as not a structure which, is, which, which can be broadly represented a la solo with one production function for the whole economic system. The idea is that there are different sectors that grow at different rates and this produce unbalanced dynamism in different sectors of the economy. And this growth with change, which is also structural change, brings with it the reinforcement of those sectors that are strong and the impoverishment of those sectors that are poor. This in economic terms and also in social and political terms. The idea of circular causation mechanisms reinforcing each other brings to an analytical perspective on the international development problem, which is based on divergence, not on convergence. And if you, um, if you take the divergence mechanism, then you cannot separate the economic efficiency problem with the problem of development as social and human flourishing. You got the principles wrong, wrong, and then policies cannot deliver simply, as simply as that. So we had different strands of divergence paradigm, and I would like to share with you um, the deep satisfaction that when you read Popularum Progressio 1967, you see that there's a clear position taken in favor of the divergence paradigm. If you read Popularum Progressio, which you, of course, already did, and but you may want to go back to it, you find uh, that it is impressive for, for its prophecy and realism, in particular, the paragraph on the, on the modern economy, that's a name that was used at the time. When speaking of the modern economy, the encyclical is clearly taking side for the divergence perspective. I quote Poplorum Progresso 8. Unless the existing machinery is modified, the disparity between rich and poor nations will increase rather than diminish. This was said in the decade of convergence. Yes, it's true. If you transfer the same economic machinery that uh, made the rich people rich to underdeveloped areas, which makes sense in a convergence paradigm, then you are bound to worsen the situation. You are bound to increase rather than um, reduce disparities. Those who come late and apply the same model are bound to remain behind in a divergence paradigm. Uh, another aspect of the divergence paradigm is that economic power that concentrates bring with it uh, political power and institutional power that concentrates. Economic and institutional dynamics are intertwined. Indeed, everything is connected. So, uh, divergence paradigms could have warned us that in applying convergent models of development would increase inequality and marginalization, including political marginalization. This is why, after so many decades, I think we are back to a situation in which peace issues are at stake in a very different way as it was in the period of the Cold War. So what can we learn from ideals and what can we learn for practice? Because I was asked to talk about ideals, but we see ideals as they deliver in practice. We don't want to use just ideals that are buzzwords. We want ideals that make the difference in everyday practice. So what did we learn from the first development decade? The period in which the international community was serious about development, was putting resources on that. 
we learned that achieving growth was much easier than reducing hunger and improving standards of living. That is to say, a technocratic approach does not deliver. The, 60s, the 70s and the 80s were the last decades of development. What was happening? Well, new changes came about. Um, new actors, sovereign nation states, had increased their power. The international landscape was not that of the post-World War War anymore. New strong economic actors were coming in in the 70s, the Arab countries, in the 80s, Asia in its different versions. And now this is what the international community was facing. Institutions that were created in the post-World War World War II order and were ready to act in a new disorder, international disorder. The cheap explanation of who, who are to blame for the dismal performance of the 70s and 80s, the cheap explanation is, well, the UN delivered, the IMF and the World Bank did not. Okay, that's cheap though, because the same international community was in charge at the UN and at the IMF and World Bank. They were intergovernmental -govern institutions, all of them. So we have to go deeper and do not keep satisfied with cheap explanations which work, superficially work, but we, we need to, to go deeper into this. And uh, the deeper, possible deeper explanation is the following. On the base of the convergence paradigm which shaped the mind of economists and politicians and uh, international institutions officers, you had a division of labor, right? Someone had to care about efficiency and someone had to care about justice, distribution, welfare. And this dichotomy, which is typical of the convergence paradigm, was reprodu reproduced in international institutions. What happened with the 70s and the 80s? We discovered that the emperor was naked. That is to say, the technical instruments were actually called to take political decisions, but they were not apt to. They were, there was a mismatch between what was asked to institutions that had to manage crisis and what were their culture, attitude, and internal rules. So reshaping global governance has to start from the very, very beginning, whether we do believe in convergence as a natural, lovely property of economic system, or whether we want to trust the much, to my opinion, interesting and deep perspective of divergence. And what can we learn from the Millennium Development Goal experience since it uh, spanned over the period 2000-2015? So it's closed. Can we learn something from that? Yes, we can. And unfortunately, what we learn is basically the repetition of what happened in the 60s. Achieving material growth was much easier than fighting hunger. M Millennium Development Goal 1 about eradicating poverty, reducing hunger, and uh, fighting unemployment is perfect as an illustration. We managed to half the number of poor, economically poor, those with an income so low that. So growth, okay. Hunger, not attained. We could not halve the number of hungry people, the percentage of hungry people in the world. Terrible. We do, did almost nothing to reduce unemployment. Actually, unemployment grew. 
both in rich countries and in poor countries. So delivering material outcomes it's, is much easier. Uh, can you deliver safe sex? Mm, yeah, that's perfect. They attain the target. That's easy. You go around and you give around practical things. Can you improve school enrollment? Yes. School enrollment goes up. Did you improve education? Well, the answer needs to be much more nuanced. That's what we have to learn about the Millennium Development Experience, because we have a sustainable de development goal that has been set, and we want to say something about it. Well, first of all, what can we say about the sustainable development goals? Well, first of all, let's look at facts, at their face value. In the Millennium Development Process, we had eight goals and 22 targets. I already spoke about some targets that were met and some that were not. The new Sustainable Development Goals include 17 goals and 169 targets. No, no, don't laugh. It's a very sad situation. That is to say, the international community is becoming aware of complexity. But the answer to complexity is trying to cope with it with an extensive list that was the object of very uh, harsh negotiation because everybody wants to have a bit of space, a slice of the endeavor. That's not integral, right? That's not integral. That's just comprehensive. But when you talk about issues that are so complex and so rapidly changing, it's hopeless to cope with those issues by simply adding, making the list of uh, dreams longer. So here I come with the final part of my presentation about challenges. And um, yeah, these are the challenges as I wrote them before listening to Cardinal Turkson. But I think that, um, okay, I, I'm trying, I'm trying. I will never be up to his wonderful synthesis, but I'm trying. Okay, first of all, the first challenge is the thinking development. Uh, Paul, uh, Pope Paul VI said that the world suffers for lack of thought, and we still are lack, lacking thinking about development. Yet, Adam Smith was quite clear when he addressed the issue uh, about what, are, what is the nature and what are the causes of the wealth of nation. And he came out with a story about human labor. Actually, division of labor and extension of markets that if you read in combi in, in combination with the theory of moral sentiments means that the nature and causes of the wealth of nation is human labor, something that is deeply human, within conditions for social friendship. You cannot divide labor in an unfriendly environment. You cannot extend markets in an, in an unfriendly environment. Uh, set of institutions. So you need non-material conditions for material growth to happen. This is what good economics should teach. We need a thick structure of friendship that builds into institutions that have to be reshaped so that the, their natural inclination to fall, uh, that, that um, I, I'm, I'm making reference to the uh, Christian anthropology. We are people that are fallen but can be redeemed. Okay, our institutions are created for good reasons, but then they fall. And we, every generation has to keep again the, with the task of redesigning institutions. It's not that good institutions are good forever. 
So we need these non-material conditions to make development pos possible. Second, we face the enduring risk of technocratic drift. Um, this is something that was very clear, that is very clear in Laudato Si. It's also in Caritas in Veritate, and it's also in Popularum Progressio. Popularum Progressio has this idea that we cannot separate the economics from the social and the political, right? That was Lebre's citation by Cardinal Tarkson. But then Populoro Progresso 34 says, it's not enough to increase the general fund of wealth and then distribute it more fairly. So, no dichotomy, no separation between efficiency and justice. It is not enough to develop technology so that the earth may become a more suitable living place for human beings. The reign of technology, technocracy as it is called, can cause as much harm to the world of tomorrow as liberalism did to the world of yesteryear. How? How about that? 1967. So I think we have to rethink development as the path, not as the destination. If we keep thinking that development is something we have to struggle to, we miss the point that development is either within the step we are currently treading or is not. Development can be just here and now or never because development is the path, not the destination. Um, and um, that, that's an, another point of uh, Paul VI, who spoke at the UN Assembly in 65. It's not, that's 65. It's not enough to feed the hungry. Each man must also be assured a life in keeping with his dignity. And dignity is an indivisible notion. Dignity is either there or not. You cannot build dignity with bits and pieces. Dignity is the full recognition of the transcendent, transcendent na nature of each human being. And um, so we go to the second challenge. The second challenge is making practical sense of integral development, speaking to the international community of integral development in a way that can be understood. We don't want integral to become a buzzword that is fashionable among Christians as sustainable is a buzzword that is fashionable in the world as lar at large. We don't want buzzwords. We want things to m m be meaningful and be easily communicable. Okay, so I think um, we want integral, not comprehensive, not complex, not multidimensional. In a sense, we want to see development at this polyhedron. One thing, one thing with many faces. Um, and so we need to keep it simple. And I think um, care for common home, which is the subtitle of Laudato Si, makes it very simple. First of all, we are talking of home. We are not talking of the house, which we may possess. We are talking of the home, that is, where we belong. We have to open a dialogue on where do we belong. And second, care. Care is a very simple word, word but it's a word that speaks about durable commitment to Take generation. Generation is not just having a baby, is taking care of that relationship, potentially forever. The same, when you care for something, that's a robust, durable concern for that something, but not for what I like of that something, for that something in its truth. So. Care is durable commitment, 
commitment to love reality as it is, reality in its truth, reality in its mystery. There are so many things we don't know. We have to take care of the things we know, and we have to take care of the things we do not know, we do not yet know. That's what it means to allow people to be dignified agents of their own destiny, loving each person in its truth, lo loving groups in their truth, going beyond all structures of sin. And the third and final, the third fi uh, challenge is, is reorganizing global governance. In a sense, what I'm saying is that what I learned from the Catholic social teaching, from the magisterium of the Pope, old and new, is that we have to go back to the future, to the ideal of human dignity. We have to rethink partnership. Partnership was Millennium Development Goal 8, achievement near zero. Partnership is a word that you find every other page of the Millennium uh, Sustain, uh, so, so, sorry, of the Sustainable Development Goal Declaration. Partnership, partnership, yes. But the common understanding of partnership is coalition for pursuing a common interest. That's not the kind of partnership we care about. We want to rethink partnership beyond coalitions. Because you can find so many partnership around 169 targets. I will simply go on doing my own interests, finding someone else with whom I can get an, an agreement. That's sad, but we, we have to remember that we are fallen as human beings. Partnership has to mean partnership with the poor because only they can tread the path of development. Each of us is poor and each of us has to tread the path of one's development. That's vocation. The poor can work the path of development, but not alone. That's partnership. Taking them as partner. I, I don't have time to develop, but I worked on a research on partnership for eradicating TB, tuberculosis, because there was a global uh, TB partnership program that was launched in 2000, maybe uh, five, say, and that has been dismantled and rebuilt, same name, new things. The old idea was we help countries to build national partnership taking in all agents that deal with TB, be they faith and non-faith non based grassroots organization. That was partnership, old idea. Partnership, new idea, we found, we find, we, WHO, find partnership with big pharmaceuticals, so they give us medicines and that's partnership. That's another idea of partnership. We have to take side on which, which kind of partnership we want to use when we build global, go global governance. And so uh, we come back to the very basic anthropological roots. If we want to change the world, a world which is very powerful and very different from what serves the hum true human flourishing, okay? So creative minorities. We have to go back in the international community and start from the very beginning, back to the future, human dignity, and open a true possibility of encounter, a space for encounter around the incandescent nucleus of being human. That is our heart which burns for eternity. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>